Ready? Mm -hmm. Most pregnancy lasts 40 weeks. A baby born before the 37th week is known as a premature or preterm baby. Medical advances have resulted in 9 out of 10 premature babies surviving. In fact, most go on to develop normally. Hi, I'm Alicia Steele. This is PBCJ's Above and Beyond. Thanks for joining us. And for those of who are joining us live, on our social media platforms, welcome. In this episode, we will be talking about premature babies in recognition of World Premature Day, which was November 17, but stretched throughout the entire month. With us in studio is obstetrician, gynecologist, Dr. Jordan Heidi, and a mother to a handsome premature baby boy, Debbie Bissoon and living proof that premature babies can grow to be healthy individuals, Dave Williamson. Welcome, ladies Thank and gentlemen. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, sure. doctor, you are the first person I'm going to interview. Ask a quick question. What causes premature birth? Oh, wow. We don't have a definitive answer for what actually causes preterm birth. Mm -hmm. However, there are many risk factors. Yeah. So if a mother has had a history of having had a previous preterm birth, if she has a large fetus or a, a large volume of amniotic fluid, uterine fibroids, which is quite common in our population, those can also increase your risk of preterm birth. A history of a pelvic infection or urinary tract infection can also increase your risk of having a preterm birth. Oh, cool. I'm going to pretend like I understand <laughs> all of those <laughs> words that you use, but I have some sort of knowledge yes. of what you say. All right, Debbie Bissoon, tell mm -hmm. us about your experience, as in what caused your son to join the world before his due date, other than him just well want to meet him, mother. That's what I was, was going to say that. I was going to say that. It's kind of hard to, to say what caused it, because mm -hmm. I was working very hard. I was yeah. on my feet every day, and I actually thought that that would have complicated things, but it didn't. It was actually when I slowed down. Because mm -hmm. he was in, his, in the correct position all along. Um, and then I remember going in for a regular checkup and they had put me on a monitor again. And mm -hmm. they said to me, well, he's in a breech position now. His legs are in your birth canal. Wow. Um, they sent me home. At first they were thinking I was having um, contractions. They said that I was registering on a monitor to have it, be having contractions. But I thought it was just like almost regular gas pains. <laughs> um, because, you know, my monthly cycle mm -hmm. um, before Sai was very... It was very rough oh, in terms okay. of the kind of pain and such. Um, so I was, let's say, used to pains mm -hmm. by now. Um, and then I remember when they discharged me from the hospital, I went home. I actually went driving. I went to the pool. I was coming out of the pool and I started feeling pains. And I thought it was gas pain. So I had said to my friend, can you make me some tea? Because I think I'm having some gas pains. Mm -hmm. And when the first one... After I had the first cup of tea, it didn't work. I had the second cup of tea. I said, listen, give me an next cup of tea because the <laughs> first cup of tea didn't work. And um, by that time, no, I was already down on the floor in pain. So they rushed me to the mm -hmm. hospital. They found that, you know, his legs were actually, like, he was walking out. And they said to me, well, you know, you have to go to the theater mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's exactly how he ended up coming on mm -hmm. the eighth month versus, you know, his, um, his natural gest um, gestation site, which is, you know, nine months. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. The good thing is that when he was born, he was eight pounds, um, and everything looked normal, enough for, for him not to, you know, stay in the hospital longer than he should, and mm -hmm. they released us both. Um, but he's a premature baby, and he's, but he's doing very well. Um, he's advancing at, I guess, the normal rate of everybody else. Mm -hmm. at, I mean, he's 18 months now. Yeah. Um, the only thing is that uh, in comparison to, and I, and I tend not to do this, and I speak about this as well as my mom's can relate um, platform, mm -hmm. that you know you don't compare children and their development yes. um, unless you, you, you kind of cite something that's really wrong. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. he responds in the same way that any other 18-month-old would do. Mm -hmm. um, and he seems to be progressing well. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Miracle boy. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Davi. I am coming right to you. 
you are living proof that premature babies can be healthy individuals. I know you probably don't know from perception because you are a toddler, but you must have heard the stories. Tell me about it. Okay, so my mom's account was mm -hmm. that on June 25th, I had to, um, she, she had to go to UA hospital to mm -hmm. deliver a baby and she wasn't expecting me until September. Okay. So I was born at six months. Wow. I weighed two and three quarter pounds. And um, she told me that on that day, three premature babies were born, two girls and a boy. She said the boy didn't live, but the two girls, of course, they were all fighters. Mm -hmm. So we kept fighting and we made wow. it. She said I had to stay in the hospital um, for one month in the mm -hmm. incubator before she could take me home. So she always reminded me of this story. Every time I feel like I'm going through something, she's like, remember, you, go, you went through so mm -hmm. much and whatever, and, and you stayed in the hospital for one month um, by yourself, and I couldn't bring you home. And she said the day she was supposed to come for me, she was so excited. Um, but when she came there, there was no incubator, no baby. So of course she was running through the hall screaming like a mad woman because she thought I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. But they took me out of the incubator. They expected me to stay longer. So that's, um, she expected me to stay longer as well. So when she came there, she didn't see me. She's like, oh my God, she's dead. So <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I made it. I'm still here. Uh, the only thing I can remember though is growing up, I was always a little smaller than everybody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. I didn't weigh um, a lot. Um, the maximum I think I weighed up to probably in my early 20s was like 110 pounds. Wow. And I remember always trying to eat, 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 and I'm always eating, and I wouldn't put on any weight, and I was telling dark hair that um, after a while, um, I, I can't get it off now. So now I'm like... <laughs> Man, what did I, I know, eat so much? <laughs> right, right. So yeah, that's just my story. So yeah, I'm here living proof. Okay, mm -hmm. but to you guys, I've always heard they say premature babies, the stigma running that they won't live. So give up on them, right? Tell me, Debbie, what's your thought on this statement? I think it's untrue. I think, I mean, they're proof. There's there are too many um, walking proofs out mm -hmm. there that you can't give up on a premature baby. You yeah. have to really stand. I know it's a, for a lot of mothers, and I remember interviewing recently um, a mother, and I think you'll speak to her shortly as well, mm -hmm. about having her triplets um in an incubator um and losing two of them mm -hmm. however she had to stay by their side um throughout the whole process it's, it's a scary process to yes. know that your child um after you've brought them thus far there's a possibility of, of losing them no mother mm -hmm. wants to face that but mm -hmm. the fact is that instead of giving up on this per, on, on this baby this is a life this yes. is a, this is a potential humor as a soul that will come here and do great mm -hmm. things and i think um i always say for, for mothers to be gifted with a child you're a physical representation of god mm -hmm. because you have created human life here yes. on earth um and i think it's a responsibility if you are if you are so blessed to conceive a child it's your responsibility to stand by that child mm -hmm. um regardless of even your fear i know sometimes it's hard but you have to dig deep mm -hmm. you have to dig deep and find that strength um, and it, it only makes sense to see them through the rough patch because if that baby comes off in, at the incubator and is now healthy and strong, I mean, you're going to be so happy that you did yes. it, you know, mm -hmm. so it only makes sense to stand by them because we've mm -hmm. seen the examples that they, it's, it's not a final, it's not, it's not a writing on the wall like this is mm -hmm. it, you know, mm -hmm. they, I mean, you never know, you never know. So you have to stand by your child. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doc, from a medical standpoint, because I am with Debbie. You can't put a stamp saying, oh, these babies won't live. But I know you must have dealt with a lot of them. Tell me from a medical standpoint, what can, what can cause them to die, which you previously mm. gave, but I want you to elaborate a little bit and mm. what can make them live. Yeah, well, I work with the mothers. Mm -hmm. However, the risk factors for prematurity and premature infants not surviving would include the, how premature the infant is. Mm -hmm. So the closer you are to term, 37 yeah. weeks, is the greater your chance of survival. Mm -hmm. Your birth weight of the infant, so infants that are less than one kilogram are at greater risk of dying mm -hmm. um, can, if they develop lung complications or respiratory distress so they have difficulty breathing so quite often these infants have to be connected to a ventilator wow. yes they are also their immune system isn't as developed as it should be so they're also at increased risk of infection 
So those are some of the primary risk factors for death in a preterm infant. So preemie babies are a glass skating on ice. So you have to be very careful. They have challenges. The pediatric wow. staff work very hard to give them the best fighting chance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this preterm infants do have challenges. Prematurity is actually the number one cause of mortality among infants. Okay. So I know premature babies have some challenge. But growing up, David, did you face any medical problems, issues growing up? Or you were a full-fledged, healthy, bouncing child? No, none whatsoever. I, I don't recall facing any challenges. The only thing my mom told me was that I had jaundice while I was in the incubator, mm -hmm. um, so my eyes were really yellow. But she said once I came out of the incubator, I was fine. But growing up, I had no challenges, none physically, mentally, um, or otherwise. I just know I was like, I didn't weigh much, so I was very light. I wasn't mm -hmm. bouncing around, yes. <laughs> but I had no challenges, really. Do you have anything to add as to telling these parents out there what to expect when raising a preterm, premature baby? Mm. Wow, I think the rest of our panel might be a little more qualified than I am. Debbie! <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, raising a preterm infant does entail some challenge. Mm -hmm. Most preterm infants will require more visits than the average infant to their pediatrician. Most preterm infants will be a little smaller than their other, mm -hmm. other age-related children. Yeah. Uh, as Debbie pointed out, Size, however, may not influence development, so it's always important to speak to the pediatrician, go for the follow-ups, get the visit so that you are aware of how your child is developing. Okay. And with that said, around 15 million babies are born prematurely each year across the world. That is more than one in 10 babies born worldwide. I want us to talk about the role a mother play in the developing process of premature babies but we have to go and take a break. This is Above and Beyond. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. So you're coming back with us? Uh, with you two and... Uh, Sarika? Okay. Sarika. Okay. So All right, could you... Are we still oh, online? Yes, we are. So, Debbie. Yes. Sai, run up and down, healthy. Yes. Not slow. Not slow at all. No, there's nothing slow about Sai. Sai is the kind of Sai is the kind of baby that will go up the stairs mm -hmm. by himself. Yes. So he doesn't want you to assist him. Mm -hmm. He holds on to the handles of it and climb up the stairs. I mean, two flights of stairs by himself. Gosh. Mm -hmm. And I think babies on a whole um, is the, the fact that
Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to PBCJ's Above and Beyond. I just want to say thank you to Debbie Williams for sitting with us and sharing her living proof that, hey, preterm babies are fine. We, are no, we have now with us uh, the founder of Pre Me, Me Foundation, Serka <laughs> Sterling, joining our panel. Right, Serka? Mm -hmm. You have this foundation, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know if it is relatively new, mm -hmm. but it's booming. Because you <laughs> see where the hospitals oh, really? <laughs> are getting stuff and you are putting the muscle and you're mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this foundation. Well, the Premier Foundation of Jamaica, we started um, 2017, November 2017. And this is two months after, you know, my baby left the hospital. Mm -hmm. It was started, you know, out of my experience while I was in the NICU. So I had premature triplets in May. Mm -hmm. um, two of them didn't survive. They lived a short period of time. And the third went on to fight for four months mm -hmm. in the hospital. And, you know, being there, meeting other mothers here, not mothers, but families, hearing yes. their experience, persons who have lost, persons who have triumphant stories, and just my story, I realized mm -hmm. that, you know, there was something lacking in Jamaica in terms of... Um, you know, awareness, mm -hmm. because while I was going through the situation, and when anyone goes through a traumatic situation, you're looking to find out, am I the only person this is happening to? Um, mm -hmm. How am I going to, you know, cope with this? Um, and what I found is that there was nothing in Jamaica. There was stuff overseas, and I said, you know, we need to start something. We need to start the conversation because mm -hmm. it's a common phenomenon. Um, it's something that a lot of persons go through because when I left the hospital, you know, a lot of mothers that I met, they said, you know, I had a pre, but you would never know because no one talks about it. And then there's also, you know, um, lacking in our healthcare system in terms of giving these babies a fighting mm -hmm. chance. Mm -hmm. So that's what the foundation was born out of. And that's what our mandate is built on in terms of equipping hospitals so that all our preemies can get a fighting chance. Um, raising awareness among regular citizens to understand that this is really a big issue. You have to be careful when you're dealing with persons who have gone through the situation. To fund um, research into healthcare because you would find that in globally they have advanced in terms of some of the things that they're doing that mm -hmm. we're not doing. Stuff like um, kangaroo care that doesn't happen here. Oh. You know, and we've heard stories after stories where you know that is also mm -hmm. beneficial. Mm -hmm. So we want to fund the research. We also want to support the families because it's very traumatic to go through a loss or just to have your baby in the NICU. Yeah. So we want to form a support system of mothers or families who understand, you know, what we go through um, to help them. So wow. yes, that's you know that's nutshell. If that's a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> that's big deal business. Yes. Mm -hmm. But as Miss Tris Sterling mentioned about the kangaroo. Mm -hmm. Mothers are known to be the best healers for preterm, premature mm -hmm. babies. What's your stand on that? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're really putting me on the hot seat. <laughs> um, the care of the infant is going to be dependent on a lot of things mm -hmm. in terms of the birth weight of the infant and how premature the infant was. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, when we deliver a an infant, and in this case a preterm infant, baby will be able to go home with mommy after a short hospital stay. Mm -hmm. But the smaller infants generally require observation in the neonatal intensive care <coughs> unit. And <coughs> for the really tiny babies, they may need ventilator support. So uh, hope it depends on the status of the infant. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a team approach. Okay. Okay. Uh, mothers definitely need to be a part of the care of their infants. Mm -hmm. Mothers also need the support of both the families, support groups, and of course the, the, the physicians uh, carry a strong hand as well. Okay. So for instance, I have a preterm baby, all right? And I get pregnant next time. Is it possible I can prevent that happening? So, having had a preterm infant mm -hmm. as a, and you're having a following pregnancy, yes, this pregnancy is, is at increased risk for preterm birth. There are mm -hmm. 
strategies that we can entail. So these patients will require more frequent surveillance, more frequent ultrasounds, depending on the cause of your preterm mm -hmm. birth. Because the most common cause of preterm birth is we don't know. Yeah. If you have an identifiable risk factor, then we may try to correct that prior to the second conception. If you are, however, pregnant and it requires, it is something that we can intervene, then we will try and put an intervention in place, whether it be a cervical circular, which is a stitch in the cervix, or there are some vaginal inserts that mm -hmm. we may offer the patients. Cool. Circa. Yes. Your preemie story. I am dying to hear it because I heard it's big <laughs> sure? and it's That's emotional. Sure it's so there. just share your <laughs> premature story. Okay, yes. so my pregnancy, well, we were shocked to find out that I was having triplets. Mm -hmm. uh, my family, um, we, we have a lot of twins and we thought that it would skip, to, skip a generation because my mom had twins. Turns mm -hmm. out my sister and myself, you know, carried multiples. So mm -hmm. when we found out we were having multiples, we were like, whoa, this is serious. Um, we didn't know it was, it, there were serious medical issues until we mm -hmm. started going to the, um, to the doctor. And they said, well, of course, you're at risk of preterm birth. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things that they explained to me was that Jamaica is just not equipped, you know, for this type of birth in most cases, mm -hmm. especially if you're going to have a preterm birth. Um, we didn't really have the option of, you know, just finding somewhere else to have the mm -hmm. baby. So we said, you know, we're just going to have to stick with it and, you know, how it pans out, it pans out. So it was going well and then one fateful morning I woke up and, you know, I I saw that I was spotting very light so I wasn't mm -hmm. worried I was just like okay I probably just need to rest let me just go to the doctor but that where I was which was 26 weeks plus um, you know I had to go to the hospital to yeah. the labor ward at mm -hmm. that time so I went and you know they found that it was not just spotting that you know my cervix was incompetent and I was having bleeding so um, I was supposed to get on some antibiotics mm -hmm. and then I was supposed to get endometrine which is the inserts that I think you were talking about but some I don't know between Wednesday and Thursday it didn't happen but Friday morning I went into labor mm -hmm. so I woke up I sat up in the bed at 5 30 and my water broke and I was like Jesus that's when fear came I was like oh my god I'm not ready because I just got got the last um, dose of Big steroids right mm -hmm. so it didn't kick in at all so I know that they didn't get it. So I was like, Lord Jesus, let's figure out this thing. The doctors tried all they could to stop the labor. I got the magnesium. I got this really expensive medication from Cayman that I can't even pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they had to call somebody to deliver it and all of that. Um, it was a very traumatic experience because from 5.30 in the morning until 11.30 in the night was when I was delivered. And that period, one, I couldn't eat. Two, they found out that I had water in my lung wow. and that my, my lung ducts were collapsing. So I had to be on oxygen. Oh, yeah. um, I had to do a CT scan for them to, because at that time they mm -hmm. didn't know it was water in my lungs. They were feared that it was a blood clot and I had a severe infection. And one of the, the babies were sitting butt first in my passage. And all of this, they were still trying to stop the labor. It got so bad that they said, boy, based on what's going on, we want to airlift you overseas because we, we just don't think that we can handle this and this was the University Hospital of the West Indies. Wow. Well, by the time they got around to get in a hospital that was willing to take me which was Jackson Memorial, mm -hmm. the air ambulance said we can't take her because no she's too severe, she's too much of a risk. So it's at that point they said well we're going to have to, you're going to have to just take the babies here. But prior to that you know, when you go into preterm labor, they send a pediatrician to have a talk with you. And basically what she's saying, it sounds very nice, but she's saying, boy, your babies just may not live and you just have mm -hmm. to prepare for that. Um, the other thing that happened was that they didn't have enough ventilators for all the babies. And they were explaining that to me and they said, boy, we don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to have to choose which babies we put on the ventilator. Oh, no. And at the time, it was one ventilator, because it was early in the day, it was like, we only have one ventilator. And I'm like, but there are three babies. And they're like, if you have to have the babies here, you're going to have to decide which baby we're going to put on the ventilator. So I was like, Lord Jesus, I'm there, I'm praying and hoping, and the time is going on and hoping. And then a couple hours after, miraculously, they said, well, my sister, we found another ventilator. But I'm still concerned, because I'm not concerned about saving two babies. I'm concerned about saving all three. Really? Um, when it got really severe, no, they said, okay, you know what, Mrs. Sterling, it's going to probably be you 
are the babies or it's going to be all of you if we don't move, right? Yes, it was that bad. And I could see the fear in the doctor's eyes because I, even after the surgery, I said to him, I said, boy, you guys don't hide fear very well. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> because, <laughs> because they came and, you know, when the doctor touched me and they looked at me and they checked two times and then the other, he said, come here. And I'm watching them and they look on his face and he's I said, boy, this is dire. So, you know, it got really, really bad where, you know, it was really life or death. And they said, boy, Mr. Sir, we just have to go forward mm -hmm. with it now. And this is at 11.30 in the night. But then I was on um, blood thinners for the mm -hmm. entire time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they couldn't do a regular C-section and they had to wait another hour and a half or two mm -hmm. hours, I think, for it to clear mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. of my system. Yeah. So that's how I ended up waiting on it at 11.30. And then they came and read me my last rites, um, basically. Yeah, man, they come and the whole team prayed. And you know, the, the anesthesiologist came in and gave me his bit and said, boy, we're going to have to put you under for this surgery because we just don't know what's happening inside of your body. Everything wow. is going crazy. And we just want you to know flat out that you may not wake up. Uh, we may not be able to save you. We may not be able to save the kids, but we're going to do the best that we can. And I had to sign another paper to say that, okay, fine, I'm okay with that. And then they explained to me at another time that, you know, if you're bleeding out, we're going to have to start removing certain mm -hmm. of your, your, your womb. Mm -hmm. And I need to sign that off as well. And they explained to me the ramifications of that. And it, it was difficult because all of that time, you're ill. I can't breathe. I'm, I have on this big face mask. I'm staring essentially death down the face. And, mm -hmm. you know, I said, you know what? Just do whatever. I mean, at this point... I can't do anything. Yes. And honestly, doctor, I don't think you, you can do anything supernatural. Mm -hmm. You can only do the best that you can do. And therefore, that's just it. So let's just mm -hmm. go into the surgery. I really would want to see my husband. And they tell me that I can't see my son, which was the saddest part because my, I, have a, I had an 11-year-old at the time. And I didn't see him all day. And I just felt like, I said, but God, you can't let me die. And I didn't see him. I didn't get to hug him. I didn't get to tell him it's OK. He's mm -hmm. somebody random. His dad is just going to tell him that his mom died trying to save mm. these kids. And I started thinking about if I die and the kids are alive, you know, are my family going to resent them? Or my husband going to manage with three kids? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was, it's, it's, it's like emotionally draining. And I thought that, you know, so we went into the surgery. I was scared, you know, but I said, boy, we have to do this thing. When I woke up, I was relieved, right? Fully drugged up. And little did I know that that was the start of the, the real mm -hmm. journey. You know, I thought that it was the end, but it was the mm -hmm. start. Mm -hmm. So all three babies were born alive, thank God. I have beautiful pictures of them. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, they're all in the NICU. We gave them names. It was Adam, Eli, and Seth. Mm -hmm. So Adam and Eli were the identical twins, mm -hmm. and Seth was the spare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they went to the NICU. They said they found miraculously found three ventilators. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they were all given a fighting chance. But after I got um, discharged, you know, they were doing well. The doctor said, you know what, they're doing well, but they're a touch and go. I still didn't get the touch and go thing. I said, yeah, man, but them I breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do a little thing. You know, them, them mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was leaving the hospital five days after the doctor said, I went in, I looked for them, I played with them and everything. And then the doctor said, you know, they're doing okay. We just have to watch them. They're doing okay for now. I went home, we were there trying to express breast milk to take back to the hospital. And then I say, you know what, I want to rest. So I went into the room to lay down and I look at my phone, I saw like 10 missed calls from a number that I did not know. When I call it back, I realized it was the hospital. And they say, you have to come now because your son, one of the son is very sick, which is Eli. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, he was a second born. When I went there, it, he passed before we got there, mm -hmm. which was... We knew because as soon as we got there, when I, they were in different rooms. So Adam and Seth, Eli mm. and Seth. So when I went to look for um, Eli, they said, you can't go in. So I went into Seth's room and I looked across and I realized that the machine was turned off. So I knew mm. that he passed before they gave me the. Mm -hmm. So I decided, they, 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 they told me, I mean, how, they share, how the doctor shared the information. I tell you, I had to see her for the next four months in the NICU, and I hated seeing her. I didn't hate her, mm -hmm. but I didn't like seeing her. She just mm -hmm. reeked of death and doom and gloom. So we decided not to see him, you know, which was tough for us, because but we didn't know how we were going to handle looking at a dead baby. Yeah. So they asked us if we wanted to see him, and I said, no, I don't. I just wanted to remember him, because he was the only one that, Funnily enough, that day, he was the only one that opened his eyes for us. 
and he was active with us and we touched him and he was moving around you know um, and we took a picture of him and we were so connected to him so when he passed I was like I don't want to see him dead I want to remember him how we were how he was so after that happened, you can imagine how tough it is to walk into that hospital every day knowing that your child was in that room. Wow. But the second one, Adam, no, which was another identical twin, he had a very rough seven weeks. He lived for only seven weeks. And I'm telling you, it was seven weeks from hell. Mm -hmm. He had to do about two and a half dozen blood transfusions because as the doctor mentioned, his um, bone marrow isn't mm -hmm. fully developed. He doesn't produce blood at the rate that he's using mm -hmm. it. And because he's fighting all these infections, he's using up way more blood than is, you know, than a normal baby would. So he, he would get transfused probably every other day or every two days. He had eye infection, he had hernia, he, his lung collapsed multiple times. You name it, he had, had it. You know, he, one day he would go and he would look rosy and plump. Two days later, he looked like a skeleton. You know, so it was very rough and I bonded with him even more than Seth because Seth was the one who was very quiet. Um, I bonded with him, watched him and the doctors telling me, boy, I'm not doing well. You know, we tried to feed him, he's mm -hmm. not feeding. But there were days when it, it was very hopeful. Um, it turns out that seven weeks after we were getting ready to go to the hospital and we got another dreadful call that, you know, we need to talk to you. So I said, all right, this sounds like it's serious. We got there and they called in the hematologist, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the pulmonologist, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one that, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the neonatologist and the doctors and they brought us into a room and they told me that there is nothing else that they can do for Adam. You know, between when I went home in the night and in the morning, he went to, into cardiac arrest twice. And, you know, when they did his x-rays, his body was just slowly shutting down. So it was a shutting down, this heart, this shutting down, this shutting down, that shutting down. And they've done everything they can. And how it works is that whatever they had to do to help him was, harmful. was harming something else. Wow. And they couldn't find the balance. Mm. So his body was just not responding. So, you know, at that time I said, I need to hold him because at that point, after seven weeks, I've never held any of them. I've never heard their voice because once you have a premature baby and they go on the ventilator, there's a tube down their throat. Mm -hmm. So you can see them crying, you can see the tears, but no one will hear them, right? So that's why they call it the silent cry. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, and I want to hold him. I don't want him to pass the way Eli did without us. I wanted to show him some love. He went through so much pain. I want him to know that it's okay and that, you know, we'll see him. So that's when they were able to take him off the ventilator. We were able to hold him and pass him between my husband and myself, sang to him, talked to him, and he died in our, hand, in our arms. We handed him back to the doctor. And it, it I mean, I don't know it, which was harder. I don't know if it was harder watching him die or mm -hmm. not being able to see him, see Eli die, see him after he died. But, you know, when it happened, you know, I say, you know, I've, I prayed as hard as I could for the last seven weeks. And I remember praying to God and I said, you know, I don't know why he's feeling, he's in so much pain. You know, he hasn't done anything. We haven't done anything. What's going on? Mm -hmm. So I was at peace with his passing when he did pass, but it did hurt like hell, just like the first time around. And me and my husband, we left the hospital and we actually, without telling anyone, mm -hmm. telling anyone that he passed, and we went down to Emancipation Park and we, we just walked in circles for the rest of the day. Our son was at school. We didn't even know how we were going to tell him. We had to call the grandparents. So it was like seven weeks later, you're sharing the news mm -hmm. of another loss. So when he died, I said, okay, I'm going to look for Seth and then I'm going to go. Walked into Seth's room and you know what happened? His heart rate fell. So as soon as I walked into the room, his heart fell, his, his oxygen, and you know it, it, it's mm -hmm. not supposed to, his, mm -hmm. his heart is not supposed to go between 90, mm -hmm. and below 90, yeah. 100, and then his oxygen is not supposed to go below 80 something. They all went down to like 60 wow. and them numbers. And I was like, Jesus, you're going to just kill this one too? Mm -hmm. While I'm here, like in front of my face, you can't just give me a little time? Mm -hmm. So I just walked out of the room and we just left because I was like, I can't, I don't think I can manage watching two child die. But he held on. He held on for four long months on the ventilator, not in an incubator. He was on the machine that had to breathe for him. And there were times when they tried to take him off, but he was just not strong enough. Mm -hmm. He fought as well. He had meningitis, sepsis, klebsiella. He had a UTI. At one point, he had to have a tube inserted in his mm -hmm. um, side because he was at risk for a pneumothorax, which mm -hmm. you know, the doctor can tell you about. It's when your lung 
pops mm -hmm. and the air escapes into your chest yes. and stops your heart. That's what happened to Eli. So he had a tube and then he had jaundice, severe jaundice where his eyes were so yellow that they were green tint. Um, his bilirubin level was like a hundred and something and mm -hmm. it's supposed to be in the single digits, right? Mm -hmm. So he went through a lot, but he fought. And, you know, after four months, we were able to take him home and another journey started. As you can see, with caring for a premature baby when they leave the hospital. We took him home, but we took home like a half a child. Before you even go <laughs> into a half a child, we'll be right back <laughs> with more PBCJs above and beyond. Oh, this is wall heap. <laughs> I told you.
straight into the thick thing. Okay? What is what? No, Let's we're not okay. We're so is this? Internet I'm not asking because I don't want to go straight into Serica. You don't want I was uh, the advice and then comments. You want to go comments and then advice to moments? I want to go this, welcome back. Comments. She finish up her story because she never finish. I break her. Okay. And then I advise and close. Yeah, she was she was talking about Yeah, she never finished. Mm -hmm. the, the, look, the comment is on. Yeah, ma'am, see the comment, man. So mm -hmm. I'll we'll adjust. Alright. So just go straight to the comments. Alright, stand by. Hold on, Hold on. Ready? In five, four, three, two. Welcome back to PBCJ's Above and Beyond. I'm your host, Alice Steele. We were talking about premature babies with Mrs. Sterling. It's devastating. It's hard, heart rending and very emotional. But before we continue with Mrs. Sterling, let's take some comments from social media. Daddy Owens is asking, is it... Again. Yeah, man, let's run it again. Again. All right. Somebody came in the room. All right, let's run it again. Just come in. Close the second door. Close the second Both doors. You still streaming? Yes, we're still streaming. Yeah, still streaming. Okay. In five, four, three, two. Welcome back to PBCJ's Above and Beyond. I'm your host, Alice Steele. Before the break, we were talking to Mrs. Sterling about her triplet premature babies. And we heard of having two babies. <laughs> Let's go again. <laughs> All right. Oh dear. In five, four, three, two. Welcome back to PBCJ's Above and Beyond. I'm your host, Alicia Steele. And before we went on the break, we were talking to Mrs. Sterling about her triplet premature babies having two past. And we were hearing the story of the third. Before we go into that, let's take some comments from social media. Daddy Owens is asking, is it true that preemie babies have head that are too big or too small? <laughs> I guess we are talking about dwarves uh, now. <laughs> no, no. No, no, no. I, I, think so one of, I think it's one of the many misconceptions of, yes. of, of, of premature yes. babies. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. the deformities and all of those things. I'm sure the doctor can attest yeah. to this as well that general population and I, I guess one of the reasons mm -hmm. why the foundation is very important is mm -hmm. that we can really put an end to all of and these educate yes. and yes. educate yes. people about you yes. know the yes. real um the real the real happenings um mm -hmm. behind yes. what happens when that we have a premature baby. baby no that's not true there, oh. there's oh, no head issue I've, I've been around many many preemies they look just like me and you yes. oh, exactly. Exactly. Albert, I, Albert Einstein was a preemie so they can be very upstanding. Yes. They're regular, regular people like you and I. My my premature baby Seth, he is not small. Mm -hmm. He is very big. He's mm -hmm. bigger than my friend's full term baby. Mm -hmm. So it, it's still a misconception that premature babies mm -hmm. are small or them head small or mm -hmm. something wrong with them. No. Okay. He's very heavy. He's about forty pounds and he's eighteen months. <laughs> normal. <laughs> normal, normal to me. Mm -hmm. T and Dollet says she feels it for Miss Sterling. Right? God will continue to bless you. That's what she's saying, mm -hmm. you know. At Pete's, at do they have issues pertaining to academics or psychological issues? Oh, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. <laughs> oh, boy. That's dependent on the severity of the prematurity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are infants who are severely preterm at 24 weeks around 500 grams who may have challenges with 
school performance. However, it's each preterm infant is different. Yes. So you can't make a broad sweeping statement. It's a little bit dependent on that infant's course in the hospital and their development through school. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before we go into getting advice and closing out our show from these lovely people here, <laughs> I think we need to continue hearing about Seth. Yes, the survivor. Yes, yeah. Seth, the survivor. So, of course, he spent four months in the hospital, as I said, fighting, fighting, fighting. He came home. And when you, when you have a premature baby and the baby comes home, that's not the end of it. You know, like when you get discharged from the hospital and you're like, yes, everything is home free. No, it's the start of a new journey because, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to look out for. One, you're not going to sleep mm -hmm. because you're going to think the day they come home is the day you're going to kill them off, right? Because mm -hmm. one, they're very, very mm -hmm. small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Seth came home at about four pounds. They don't let them out until about four pounds. So daddy don't want to hold him. I feel like I'm going to break off a limb or something. So there's mm -hmm. that. There's two, you can't sleep because you think that they're going to stop breathing. Mm -hmm. So for me, I couldn't sleep. I was watching him if he looked too still at joking him, <laughs> seeing his breathing. And then he breathes funny. Mm -hmm. So he breathes as if he's, have, he's struggling to breathe. And then there are times when he'll stop breathing for like a couple of seconds and mm -hmm. have apnea. So you have to watch out for those things as well. Also, we had to test every single organ in his body. I think it's because of what he went through. So mm -hmm. he did a cranial scan, a renal scan. He did an um, a echocardiogram, gram, heart mm -hmm. test, hearing, eye exam, and the kidney. And they have to repeat those tests because mm -hmm. wow. you have to get a baseline. Mm -hmm. Then you have to test again Progress. to see if whatever is, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, is healing. Mm -hmm. And he also left the hospital with the UTI. So he had to be on antibiotics, mm -hmm. right? So you have to watch his medication. You have to watch who comes around him because mm -hmm. they're predisposed to, as I said, the common cold can mm -hmm. kill them because they are still considered underdeveloped because remember, mm -hmm. he was not supposed to be born until October, August. Mm -hmm. And then he has already been set back by going through all of these illnesses. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a cost yeah. to it. So having a premature baby on the NICU at the time when I was there is $20,000 per child per day. Wow. So if you do the math with me having a child here for four months, twenty thousand mm. dollars per day. I know. And that excludes if they have to do any kind of procedure. Mm -hmm or if there's any mm -hmm. special medication that he needs that has to come out of my pocket. Wow. And then there's a back and forth. So when I left the hospital, I had about a $3.6 million bill. You know, yes, because I remember I had three babies. So that's $20,000 mm -hmm. per day times mm -hmm. three for, for a period. Then there is $20,000 per day times two for a period. So the cost is high. And then when you leave, there are all these tests that you have to do because we have to pay for those tests mm -hmm. as well. So there's a high cost in terms of caring for the baby. Then you have to talk about home care. Are you going to get that person from the daycare? Mm -hmm. Are you going to um, get somebody to come in? And um, one of the things that I want to touch on as well is the, 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 the paternal to leave which is what you know, I'm happy that they're talking about that now mm -hmm. because majority, when when my son passed you know my husband had to use his vacation leave mm -hmm. for the entire time and it would have mm -hmm. been great if you know he was able to use his paternity leave mm -hmm. to, to help out around mm -hmm. but he had to be skipping through do I have enough you know mm -hmm. sufficient time and you know mm -hmm. hoping that they'll give him the time so back to when the babies come home now he's 18 months old and he still has to go to prem clinic you know I think prem mm -hmm. clinic is every three months mm -hmm. what they do is they check his development because he's not mm -hmm. he will not be progressing as a normal child mm -hmm. so his milestones will be checked differently they're also watching them for any kind of long-term illnesses that may would have, that would have come as a result because when they're on the ventilator as a doctor mm -hmm. can tell you you know the oxygen is going up and down and the mm -hmm. oxygen flow is very important to the brain so I guess that's why a lot of people ask about you know if they're mm -hmm. slow yeah you yeah. get me because sometimes when they can't breathe properly the oxygen get cuts off over the period of time you have to resuscitate mm -hmm. them the oxygen get cuts off and that can lead to cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. it can lead to learning development and other kind of issues. Mm -hmm. For Seth, he suffered a slight damage to the part mm -hmm. of the brain, which I can't remember that deals with motor skills. Mm. So it took him a while to walk. So we did a little therapy. Mm -hmm. 
But then I met another mother who his baby, her baby has spastic cerebral palsy. So mm -hmm. the, the effect is different Very and it's wide. Mm -hmm. So I may lose a baby, but then you have another mother who has to deal with a child that has a lifelong illness, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a lot to take on. So, you know, you have to watch them carefully. You have to ensure that they, they're at all their doctor visits. You have to be careful who is around them and you have to be intuitive as well. So Seth is doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. He eats well. <laughs> <laughs> he just started walking. He's 18 mm -hmm. months old, which I'm very happy because, you know, I used to call up the doctor and be like, at least him now walk. Well, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when if you care, I've got a foot specialist. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, and the doctor said, just give him some time. Mm -hmm. So he's walking and so now we move on to worrying about the speech because you, for preemies, you're worried until, as I tell people, I'm going to be worried yeah. until he's about 10 because I'm worried is he going to talk? Then mm -hmm. when him start talking, I'm going to be like, him can't learn. Mm -hmm. And everything happens is going to be, oh, it's because him bring him can't yes. learn. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it takes a lot more. I never had this issue with my first child, mm -hmm. but now I watch everything. And he also bond a little bit more because, you know, of the fight they went through. Mm -hmm. And one thing I can tell you, Seth is a fighter. He is a fighter. Is Even a though fighter. you see he right now, he's a fighter. Yes, he is. Yes. So... so. They do have a chance to be yeah. great. And what I want through, through the Premier Foundation, what I want to let the policymakers, citizens and everyone know is that you have to give premiers a fighting chance mm -hmm. because they, mm -hmm. they, 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 they come out to be regular, regular citizens of society and people who can make a real difference. So our healthcare system and our caregivers need to be in a position where they are given a fair chance at survival. And you, you know, you can't tell, you're not telling a family that we don't have a ventilator, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you're going to have to just watch your child die. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very difficult. Mm. Wow, Serka, this is heavy stuff. Oh, uh, it's a lot. Yes, it's yes. a lot. Mm -hmm. But I am glad you could educate me <laughs> and my audience, mm -hmm. you know, because there's stuff here that I didn't know when I learned today, you know, and my heart goes out to you. But Debbie mm -hmm. and Dr. Hardy, what advice can you give our viewers for premature on the medical side and on the mommy? who have a little front of my dough, <laughs> <laughs> kid. Well, um, as, as Sarika said, said, it's very important to give preemies a fighting chance because mm. you never know. Um, it's very important that you, you, you stay by your child, as I said mm -hmm. before, um, and just understand as well that they will develop differently and you have to mm -hmm. give yourself the kind of room mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. for this as well. So don't mm -hmm. come down too hard on yourselves as mothers. As Sarika said, you become very obsessed in calling the doctor, you know, <laughs> am I doing something wrong? And you start blaming yourself as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you have to be able to just understand that it's a process. Um, and it's development, so it mm -hmm. won't happen overnight. You know, it will take some time to progress. Um, and give yourself that, you give yourself, yourself, the mother who has to now take care, and the father mm -hmm. um, has to take care of this baby with special yeah. need, that kind of need, mm -hmm. you know. Um, give yourself the kind of room um, to allow the process and the development to happen. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hardy. As it relates to pregnant mothers who think they might be at risk for preterm birth, contact your obstetrician immediately so that you can be assessed. So if in the event it can be prevented or your time to deliver can be delayed, it will be in your infant's best interest. If you do have a preterm infant, there are resources now available. You have the Premier Foundation. We have trained neonatologists. Mm -hmm. uh, seek as much support. Seek as much information as possible. So the exciting part. Mm -hmm. Moms and memos, <laughs> you have that event. <laughs> you, Debbie, let me tell you my audience, Debbie is a mommy, <laughs> a mommy advocator. No, mommy. listen, let me tell you. Moms and memos, this, I about it. So this whole journey of becoming a mother mm -hmm. was, was something for me that I never thought was possible as well, having told, been told that I couldn't produce mm -hmm. you know, or, or have a child. So of course, having a child for me was a big deal. And then as well, after having the child, then it comes to, okay, so what do you do with it? You know, it's here. <laughs> so what do you do with it? And then you know, as a new mom, you're learning all these things. And mm -hmm. sometimes the books and the advice don't adequately prepare you for your unique experience. And that's it. Every mother has a unique experience that, you know, I, I find that with sharing, and that's the reason why we created the Moms Can Relate podcast, mm -hmm. in sharing the experiences, it will be different, you know, each mm. mother will have a different story, but there are things in, in there that will be relatable and you'll feel, as Sarika said, that you're not alone on the journey. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did was, because every day is Mother's Day mm -hmm. and during the holiday period, yeah, Mother's Day doesn't happen now. Yes. Day, no, so it's every, every day. day is Mother's Day. Um, and you know the holiday period, mothers, mm -hmm. we get consumed with 
decorations, presents, all mm -hmm. of these things, and we don't get to spend any time at all on ourselves and work right yes. throughout the year. And here we are now mm -hmm. ensuring for the rest of the family that the holiday is perfect. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is kind of bring mothers together so we can have a time to relax indulge and relate um, in a very fun atmosphere with some mimosas of course if you're if you're a mother who's not breastfeeding then you you'll enjoy mimosa you know but i mean if you are breastfeeding as well we we want you to come because we have options there for you so we say it's for moms and aspiring moms as well we're creating a village of mothers to support and to help and to be a resource for other mothers and for mom, for women who want to know about mm -hmm. motherhood even men I, I i find a lot of men dming me and asking me oh can i come to the event of course you can come <laughs> shut the door on you because it, it's a collective effort you know mm -hmm. the village has really modernized and um it's a, it's it takes everybody's hand to to grow a child so mm -hmm. we want to be able to come together in a fun way on december 1 at the serengeti hope zoo from 4 until 8 30 in a very fun way um to connect and to have a great time and to learn a lot because that's what we're going to be doing learning a lot and we're encouraging attendees to carry something so if you have baby clothes if you're if you're a mother like me who shop and by holy patting zero to three. <laughs> I never think of, about the fact that I'm going to pass grow. three months quickly <laughs> and you have a holy for things that you didn't use. Yeah. I mean, bring them. We, we want pampers, we want um, wipes, we want clothes, we want toys, we want books. Because we want to wrap them up. And there, there, there are some members of our, of our society, kids, babies, who are not able to mm -hmm. enjoy the luxuries that most of us enjoy, especially mm -hmm. during the holiday period. Yeah. And we want to gift them with something to, you know, brighten up the Christmas holiday. Um, and that's our part. So while we are indulging and, you know, replenishing ourselves, mm -hmm. we want to also give back because that's what we are, nurturers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will definitely be there. And if you're a mom like me, <laughs> who just buy stuff for a five-year-old, just for buying sake, exactly. you'll have a lot at home to give. So come on over, moms and mimosas. So with that said, thanks to my lovely guest you're welcome. for you're being welcome. here. To my audience, I want to thank you for watching. This is Above and Beyond, pleasant viewing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And remember to live good and just be happy. This show is endorsed by Tamia Carey, collection that is. Good sketch? When she said remember, I thought she was going to say no focus but no locus. <laughs> 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 that would have been so funny. Yeah, I like, oh, no, she didn't know.